All right, all right. It's that time of the day, time of the month, yada, yada, yada. Rich Casanova here in the Global Podcast Studios in Atlanta. And uh, joining me, as always, on this episode is the man of the hour, Mr. Dwayne Hart. Uh, today's topic, reg- always uh, regarding cybersecurity, is online scams targeting veterans, veterans and active duty members. Uh, we've talked about uh, cybersecurity in the military and government agencies and a lot of other um, sandboxes. But this one's kind of unique. Why do you think this one uh, stands out? Because I'm a 20-year veteran of the United States Navy myself. And when I go back and think about my 20 years that I served in the military, and, you know, outside of cybercrime, right. thinking about some of the other crime that has happened to military veterans, even so military veteran that goes to purchase a car and end up paying a 50% interest rate on that car, right? right. So, so, so this dear... And it's hard to me because I was a veteran. And I will say that partially of the reason that it serves so important to me is that I know that there are probably uh, certain groups of veterans now that are probably being scammed as we speak. Yeah, we talked about before we went on the air about um, obviously cybersecurity, online scams and so forth. But well, I think what's unique <clears throat> about this is we talked about like the military uh, all branches of the military have some version of boot camp, right? But it's more like in the real world, you know, uh, cert- not so much online, right? Uh, oh, you talked about there is a cyber uh, warfare mm-hmm. as well component. And obviously there's branches or segments of the military that specializes in online, but it's really dealing with, you know, another agency or government agency or another um, uh, somebody else attacking the platform you know, housed and responsible for, you know, their job at their role in the, as a military, right? But like you said, once they leave that military base, um, they have that personal life and where the, uh, the newest, I don't know if it's how new it is, but the, uh, the cyber criminals are increasingly targeting them because if, if a, uh, active military, for example, gets an email that appears from some government agency, they're going to, for the most part, figure it's legit and there's some urgency to it. And they're used to responding to a lot of military communication. Yeah. Right. So it's not uncommon. And so they fall into the FTC right now says there's 267 million in total losses among the military community um, just in a single year. Well, you know what? Let's just, let's just take this for action here for a minute because I want to dive into the mindset of a military person. Okay. Military personnel are taught to be responsible. Right. Okay. If you have a bill that you need to pay, you don't want your commanding officer to get that notice. Right. 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 So, so because military uh, personnel are taught to maintain their responsibility, they may be more apt and quick to respond and say, I'll go take care of it. Yeah. Because, in the email, it could say that if you don't pay this in three days, then I'm going to call your commanding officer. Right. And you don't want that to happen. So, you know, between the process, I think military veterans still kind of have to uh, be wise about the way that they approach cybersecurity because most military people are taught about combat warfare and trying to protect the ship or to pre- or to protect the squadron or to pre- or to protect their units. Right. Now, now when it comes to cyber warfare, it's about trying to protect your uh, individual personal life or to protect the military cybersecurity efforts. So so I think that when I look at a military person and knowing that your entire life is enclosed into the government and you're safe and you're taken care of, mm-hmm. and it's only a small fraction of your life have to really deal with the personal side, and that's when you leave a military base, right? So part of that is to have that transitional mindset and to say, okay, I'm not, I'm not working on the military base. Yeah. You're not in that bubble anymore. Right. Once you leave the bubble. Right. Right. Now what happens is I'm at Walmart. Yeah. Okay. This is, this is not a ship. Right. (laughs) Not yet. I'm sure Walmart will be (laughs) housed on some (laughs) aircraft soon, coming soon, but yeah. (laughs) Yeah. So that's the type of mindset that has to be deployed. Right. 
Yeah, like keep the military hacker's hat on, right? Which when you're in, in uniform and you're on that base and you're active uh, military, I think your, um, your antenna and your alert is so much higher, right? Yes. And when you leave, um, you're thinking you're still kind of covered under that umbrella, but, but not, uh, in fact, not true at all. Matter of fact, uh, we were talking about an article beforehand about um, uh, typically a red flag is something you have to do immediately. And that's how the, um, the cyber criminals are now approaching these active military of getting that uh, and saying, in essence, click on this link or something bad's going to happen to you. But in reality, you know, banks and credit unions will never reach out to you, right? Government agencies are not going to reach out making a demand. They say that be, be on the lookout, for example, of anyone claiming to be from the VA or other government agencies, um, they're never going to threaten you or, or pressure you to send information or money. Right. You know what? Um, you brought up something that was very important. You know, we're talking about the Veterans Administration. Yeah. And um, looking at the amount of veterans that have to go there for health care. Right. Okay? And, and you know, just think about a cyber criminal just trying to grab information from right. these veterans and uh, send them a bogus website. Right. And say you need to put your information in here for your next appointment at the VA. Well, I'm just citing an example now. I don't know if that ever happened. Oh, sure it does, yeah. Okay, but but it's something to think about, all right? Now, if you're a military veteran and if you're sitting there listening now, um, you're probably saying to yourself, wow, okay, well, I didn't know that. And see, this is the purpose of these podcasts is to go put information out because mm-hmm. – you know, there are people that spend their whole entire life in the military for 20 years. Right. And, and and you imagine a scam that comes through and, you know, it's kind of um, takes their retirement check or their VA disability paycheck away. Right. That's that's that is not a great position to be in. But I can say for sure is that as a military veteran, I know for a fact that when I was in uniform, there were people trying to give me all kind of things for free. But, right. But, you know, they wasn't free. Okay. <laughs> Discounts on cars and apartments. And, and there are legitimate businesses that, um, that want to honor their, their service in the military duty would, right? Right. And there's very legit. But um, not that any cyber criminal is a good criminal, but this has got to be the lowest rung of the ladder, the most disgusting uh, among, uh, in addition to like preying on senior citizens, right? right? Because rather than honoring the sacrifices that are made by the active duty members, you know, and veterans and their families, cyber criminals are increasingly targeting them. I mean, that's just beyond well, well, uh, imagination, right? Like, well, well, we think about this is what will, will, you know, the bigger question is what really draws the attention to military veterans, right? Okay, what 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 is it so? unique about them being being a honeypot, as I may call it, right? Right, right. Okay. And and I have to say that because uh, one factor is that the way that the monetary system works for military people, right? Because they have a guaranteed paycheck. So right. if so if you find a way to scam them, then you can pretty much just, you know, get them caught up into spending money every month because see, they're obligated to do it because maybe they signed a piece of documentation. Maybe it's an online scam or something like right. that. Right. But at the end of the day, um, it is, it is bad, especially if you have a military personnel that is deployed and right. you know, they get an yeah. email, you know, they can be on a ship or they can be deployed with a unit somewhere in South America, maybe on a training exercise and you get an email talking about, well, you know, like we didn't receive your car payment and someone sends you a picture of your car and say, okay, well, we're going to take your cars, you know, you know, send us, you know, speedily a thousand dollars to this account. Well, you know what? Um, that could be horrifying, especially if someone uh, really, really doesn't understand the financial system. But I will say for sure, if the military does a great job of educating people on the financial system okay. and trying to protect themselves away from crime. Right. Okay. But, you know, the cyber criminals um, uh, still likes to find those soft targets. And well, so- and you mentioned about active military when they're um, deployed, you know, around the world. Mm-hmm. But the other side of that piece of the puzzle is there's probably um, activity 
uh, tar- targeting the family members, oh, yeah. the spouse that it's home. And if uh, if your spouse is serving overseas and um, you, it's difficult to reach them, that's a open. That's a floodgate. You know, a door opening for the the, the uh, cyber criminals because then they could potentially contact by phone or email, what have you, the spouse and say, you know, your um, spouse needs some form, some paperwork filled right, out, right? right. Um, and obviously you're going to want to take action if it looks like it looks from an agency. So the general, correct me if I'm wrong, but the general rule of thumb here applies to, you know, civilians or, you know, employees, you know, kids, families, elderly, obviously including the, the military we're talking about today. The rule of thumb is if you, got, if you get contacted from your bank, a credit union, an agency, a government, what have you, it could be legit. Nine times out of ten, they're not going to contact you with this sense of urgency and and threats, whatever, right? No. But even if it's non-threatening, it just seems like pretty straightforward. The rule of thumb is always uh, remove yourself from that email and that link or that phone call and contact that agency, the IRS, for example, or whoever it is, the VA office, contact them directly and talk to someone so you're proactively and confirm and uh, I mean, I've, I remember I lived in California and occasionally I get letters from some um, business activity I had in California and I wouldn't respond to that letter that came in the mail. I would, yeah, and you don't call the phone number that's in the letter, right? You actually go online and find the agency in that town or that city and contact them. Yes or no? I mean, isn't that the uh, right. rule of thumb? Well, that's the rule of thumb. And I can tell you for sure is this, is that is that we also have to look at the fact is that military spouses are probably at home and taking yep. care of their families. Right. And then their spouse is deployed. Right. And, um, you know, there is email and there is communication. Mm-hmm. But still the probability of cybercrime occurring to their spouse mm-hmm. is there. Now, I also would say that that's why a lot of military personnel stay very close to military um uh, installations and try to take advantage of opportunities such as if you have a naval like a naval exchange or you have an air force exchange or right. if you have a combat survey located on base so yeah there's not, a community there yes yeah. yes so you're not you know uh you're not dealing with any other type of crime and also too most of the vendors that come on a military base and operate mm-hmm. well you're vetted first big time yeah okay so so i'm just here to say that part of the cybercrime community is not so much in the interest of military personnel and veterans. I think that as a military person and as a veteran, you just have to be wise about what you do because at the end of the day, a cyber criminal is a cyber criminal. Right. Okay. They're, they're not, they're not there for the love of your life. Yeah, they don't have any <laughs> of your interest no, uh, um, at heart. Um, Another topic, two more uh, topics I would I'd like to cover is about you know freezing the credit card or setting up alerts and then email passwords. In this um, article, there was an uh, another tip about email passwords that we hadn't discussed in the past. But uh, first of all, talking about you know their credit cards and so forth, right? And loans. Um, they were talking about suggesting potentially you know using the uh, ability short term if you're on a short term assignment, even just a two week uh, training session. Rather than doing a permanent freeze, you can contact your uh, credit union or credit card companies and act, ask for an active duty uh, alert, yes. right? You so, know, I will say this for sure. Uh, there are some institutions such as um, Navy Federal Credit Union, which is really good at sending alerts. Right. If you are located in Norfolk, Virginia, right, and if you have a credit card and somebody um, – did a transaction over in Los Angeles, California, right? right? Um, most of the times, they will send you an email if it's back-to-back transaction, especially if you're located in Norfolk, Virginia, right. and you just <laughs> spent $50, and then, what, five minutes later, <laughs> right. you know, there's $500 being spent out in Los Angeles, California. Um, you will probably get a text message from Navy Federal Credit Union. Right. Which is which is good. Okay. Yeah, and if you use that type of military institution, they're uh, hardwired for these types of alerts, whatever, right? Yes. Uh, they know that if you're active, you're likely to be traveling, stationed at different places, and your spouse is maybe using the same credit card in their city. 
uh, a lot of uh, contingency built into that. The other thing that was interesting is talking about email and passwords. Um, this should be like uh, an obvious thing, but when I read it, it was interesting saying the email accounts, the email account that you use on social media should never be the same that you, tied to your bank accounts. And I know someone that's potentially guilty of that, right? Um, um, because the, so uh, actually we were talking today on a, uh, on another meeting about uh, hacking on social media. And apparently it's a lot easier than most people would think. Um, and once they have that uh, email and, um, and password, they can basically just do a search through your bank accounts. And if it lines up, you have what we call a Scooby-Doo moment, right? Rut row. Yeah. But you know what? Uh, this goes back to one of the previous podcasts that I have, and it was called individual protection standards. And looking back at that podcast and how, how I brought into attention about when you're using social media, uh, you got to make sure that you use strong passwords. You know, you can't use a four, a four character password. Right. You know, last week I posted some information on my chief of cybersecurity um, Facebook page, which shows you that that if you have a four character password, it only really takes about two minutes to crack it. OK, if you have a 16 character password, it take about 300 years. <laughs> yeah, that was a, that was a surprising stat. I, I've actually repeated that uh, to a number <laughs> of people since we had that conversation of, um, you know, that that finite number three to six characters. It can take up like three seconds for them to hack. You go to 16 characters, which sounds annoying as a consumer or the person. But once you store and save that and um, uh, yeah, somewhere like 3000 years or something insane. Right. So they're probably not to even. It's like you talk a lot about like uh, the analogy to your front door. If you have the deadbolt, deadbolt on it and you have the light lit outside and you have the security sign on your window or in the front yard, um, it's going to cause that that. Uh, you know, attacker there in that case, a robber to pause. And if they go next door, next door, there's no light on, there's no security thing out there. You know, they're going to go for the uh, path of least resistance. Well, what it's called is right. It's called a soft targets. Okay. Okay. What we have in the cybersecurity industry is that, that we have these attack vectors. Okay. You know, when you think of an, an attack vector, it is an entrance to a network. Okay, hackers like different type of attack vectors. Maybe it may be a user, or maybe it may be a computer, maybe it be a flaw and a vulnerability, right? And they can serve as an attack vector, but you know, the idea is not to become a soft target. Right. Okay, because a soft target is like unprotected and very vulnerable. Right. So if you're a military veteran, you don't want to become a soft target because you know, the analogy I like to put in place is that all military and veterans have been through a training based on combat warfare. Yeah, right. Okay. Right. <laughs> so in the nature of combat warfare, you are taught about risk, mm -hmm. right? That, you know, before you engage the enemy, you need to have an understanding of the type of risk that you face because, you know, you want to look at the vulner vulnerabilities right. and threats you got to face. So, so if you take that concept, of combat warfare, mm -hmm. and if you apply that to your personal life, right? Okay, and say that before I engage Walmart, right? <laughs> <okay>. <laughs> I guess need, they're not going to be a sponsor of the show anytime soon. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I need to have an understanding of how I need to protect myself before I go in there and use my credit card, right? Right, right. and um, you know to give give information out, okay? right? So, so because we're so accustomed to just using our social security numbers so much when we're around our military installations. Right. But when you leave out that front gate or you leave your ship or you leave your squadron, you know, you really have to think that that the same um, people that you deal with on the military base are not the same people that, right. you, that you're dealing with when you go to – um, one of the public uh, stores right. or grocery store out there because they don't have interest in you. I would say some. Let's right. just say some. Yeah. Some do not carry the same interest as your military um, comrades 
and uh, well, they may, but it's not just as high of a, of a priority. Right. But, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Some. So, so I like to use the word "some" because you know it's not everybody that is a cyber criminal. Yeah. <laughs> right. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> um, but speaking of some stats, I should have shared earlier on this topic of military vets. Before I share that, just want to remind our listeners: you're listening. Um, to Rich Casanova here alongside Dwayne Hart um, in our global podcast studios here in Atlanta. We're talking all things cybersecurity. In this case, this episode dedicated just to uh, online scams targeting veterans and active military duties. And to learn more about our guest, um, it's very simple. Um, he's got all the social media handles. He's got his YouTube channel. He's got now his Facebook. He's got his podcast. He's got a book. But instead of giving out all that, all you have to do is do what? Just go to Dwayne Hart. Dot com. Right there, you're going to find links to his podcast, uh, which we record here in the studio on a regular basis. Um, is you new YouTube? You can find the link on there as well as social media, and I'm sure there's a contact form you can reach out and uh, reach Mr. Hart and uh, with any questions or uh, follow up. Um, so, with that being said, again, DwayneHart.com uh, for everything we're talking about today and more. But stats are interesting. Um, seven. It says seven and ten. Staggering stat: Seven in ten military or military vets and active duty service members have been a victim of a um, at least one digital crime, according to a recent poll. Wow, that's staggering. Seven out of ten. Yeah, that's you know, if I look, I don't at think that the number, average civilian uh, would would align with that. So, so I like to take that number and I look at that based on some of the smaller. Um, units in the military okay and knowing you got 400 people right and there's about 280 people that are victim of um yeah. some type of cyber crime that's that is an alarming number um you know what but 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 it can be fixed big time okay so so it's not like um you know it has to be there forever because because we're smart enough to beat the hackers to the finish line. Yeah. Okay. So if you're a military veteran, go out there and put on your hacker's hat. Think about combat warfare and beat them to the finish line. And, and two of those tips along this line would be, for example, um, there's, there's a number of services that, uh, for example, encrypted email platform like uh, Proton Mail. Um, because sometimes I get a business communication from um, someone we're working with, and it has their email address, but at Proton Mail, and it's different than your Gmails or your Yahoos or AOLs or whatever, right? Where um, you really can't respond directly to the people. There's there's a buffer, there's a barrier between you know the two, which is a little bit again kind of an annoyance, but. Um, but they really don't have access to like your Gmail, and they really can't track. And you have to like when you respond to them they have to verify that you're the person they're communicating with. It's a, it's an interesting level of right. uh, another layer of security. Another thing uh, I was learning before we went on the air, and actually I did it well um, a little bit earlier today, is, uh, and I've used Google Voice, like we're talking about phones, because there's a whole other uh, level of uh, scam happening on their mobile device, right? Now, we've been talking about email and letters and phone calls, right? But there's text messaging and so forth on your mobile device. And I've been using uh, Google Voice for a long time. So pretty much if you have a Gmail account, which is free, you can uh, claim a phone number that's not related to your to your actual mobile phone at all, right? And you can kind of screen all those whenever you give out your phone number because a lot of websites and even purchases you make online or offline, it requires you can't go to the next step without a phone number because they want to send you text wow. alerts, and which is sometimes helpful to get the reminders when the service person's going to show up at your house or whatever, right, when your shipping is, is arriving or when you register for an event. You have to put in a, and they won't accept, like, you know, most people don't have a landline. It has to be identified as a mobile phone number. I never give out my personal phone number online. I use my Google phone number. But there's another service I was not aware of and just registered for today as a result of you educating me on this. It's called TextNow. Um, and again, they'll, re they'll issue a local phone number based on your town, but it only rings to that number and you can screen all those. Uh, and I get a lot of robo calls and scams into that and it never comes to my personal phone number. Yeah. Yeah. Another way to prevent these, um, attack, these cyber criminals attacking your personal information. Yeah. Yeah. There's, there's all type of, uh, 
several uh, texts and standards that you can put in place. Um, you know, speaking of see, speaking of one of the things is that I always like to look at the type of defense strategy. Right. You know, <laughs> speaking of defense strategies, you know, that's one of the live streams you, you know, I just completed, mm-hmm. which is talking about being a human firewall. Okay. And see, that's part of that defensive mindset and to know that that you have to be that protective shield. And part of that protective shield is to make sure that you follow best practices such as password protection, make sure you don't share your social security number. If it seems like something that is wrong, you know, you raise your cyber senses and do not act upon it because it may sound like a really good deal, okay? But at the end of the day, you know, once you commit to that deal or to whatever type of offering there, you are probably stuck in a contract. And it's been plenty of military personnel that get, you know, caught up in different uh, contracts and they're obligated to stay in those contracts because of the contract language that right. is written. So so you really have to think about cybercrime because cybercrime can be bad for the military as well because what if the cyber criminals are trying to gain top secret information from a military right? Member, all right? See... So it can go through social media, and it can feed everywhere. Yeah, you hit on something new that just dawned on me. You talked about earlier in the show, like your commanding officer and so forth. Uh So uh, I think this is one of the unique things, not discussed in this article we've been referencing, but it just came to uh, top of my head, is that when you're trained to um, uh, fall in line, right, with your chain of command, right, Mm -hmm. and when you get a command or, or from your uh, uh, superior officers, uh-huh. you know, you're just wired, hardwired to do that, right? Yes. You don't really ask questions, right? right. And, um, and so this could be another case of a cyber criminal saying that email or the communication is coming from your uh, commanding officer. Yes. And you're trained not to say no or ignore that or, right? I mean, that's well, another layer, right? Well, well, I think the most defensive... Uh, way of looking at this concept is that your command officer probably would never send you an email to Gmail, okay, right. or like Hotmails. It's usually a military domain such as Navy.mail, Air Force.mail, right. or whatever your military email address. But even when you get that and it's asking you out of the out of the ordinary request, you know, for something financial or what have you, uh, it just behooves you to say, let me blink. Let me just call Tom or Ted or Susan well, or whoever it is, right? And say, did you request this? Or like, no, I have no idea what you're talking about, right? Or yes, and then you obviously, you know, if you get the confirmation from the person, not a bot or a digital, you know, well, demand or command. Well, right? I got something to say. I was in the Navy for 20 years. And, uh, and sometimes, you know, the U.S. Navy sailors. Right. Those individuals do not and do not like to spend money. So I'm pretty sure if they're on a ship... <laughs> They're going to go rock to their commanding officer uh, stateroom and knock on the door, right? Yeah, yeah. Sir, yeah. I have a question to ask you. Right. <laughs> I know what that, that but $500 transfer you wanted me to transfer <laughs> to uh, right. Ohio, the city of state I've never been to. Yes. Um, okay, two last topics because we're almost running out of time here. So um, I'm going to mention, um, you know, another scam that they're very aggressive about, fraud. Uh, increasing on Zelle, for example. But I want you to maybe wrap up, unless you have obviously any other points, but you've referenced this before, but uh, talk to us in a second about multi-factor authentication, okay. right? But um, but speaking of Zelle, so I've, I've, I haven't used Zelle a whole lot in the past, but I'm seeing, it seems like I'm using it more and more often. And you have to type in that person's phone number or email and when you see the picture or something aligned, you figure it's legit, right? But once it's been transferred digitally, it's, you know, I'm sure they have safeguards in place, but it's a whole more complicated to say, oh, you know, Dwayne, that, that transfer never got to you. So it obviously it got intercepted. Um, and to co- contact those financial institutions, get that money rerouted. I mean, that's, you're talking about Pandora's box, right? Right. So, you know, the easiest way to approach any of this is to is to be wise about what you do because once those transactions go in place, it is hard to recoup that money. Yeah, to reverse that. Okay, because because we know there are a thousand endpoints and right. we live in a digital world. Right. Now, okay, but to track money down as it goes through 
this digital world is increasingly hard. Yeah. Okay. You probably would never receive that money back again. Right. Okay. Yeah, because and there are some of those like um, Venmo and so forth that have that built in. Maybe PayPal or some of these have built in. It is that because uh, I I did it a while back. It was a small transaction, and that's another kind of um, you know again a tip because we talk about a lot of the what the cyber criminals are do. Here's how you can uh, react to that, right? So say hypothetically, Dwayne reaches out to me and says, uh, "Rich, here's a request from Zell for five hundred dollars," right? And I know Dwayne, sounds legit. And we did, we had something that, you know, um, uh, you know, there was some reason for 500 rings a bell, whatever, right? Some type of transaction, what what have you, right? And so I go, I want to, you know, pay him through Zelle. But either I reach out to you again directly um, from a phone number I know and talk to you. Is that the 500 requested? No, it was supposed to be 100, right? Or $50. They added a zero to it, right? And or what you can do, another safeguard is a tip, is if it, Everything adds up and makes sense, but you know, I'm not 100% sure if that's the right email that's connected with your Zelle account, that's connected to your bank account, routing number, all that stuff. I send you a simple transaction of a dollar, right? And then you confirm on your end, yes, I got the dollar. So now I know you're going to get the other $4.99. You right? know what? That's, that's a very smart concept. Thank you. Uh, Every uh, once in a while, I have a bright idea. I, no, I mean, no, we have no. the we have the the studio lights turned on high high beam, so maybe that helps. <laughs> you are the superstar, man. You are the superstar, Rich. I that that works well, right? Because if you send out a dollar, right, right, and then I call you or see you, yeah, I guess yeah, yeah, it's 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 like this. Okay, so so you do a test first, right, right. You know, you're testing it out first, yep. just to go and make sure. You know, that's. That's part of the cyber senses there, okay, right. and trying to use your cyber senses and and to identify um, how can you minimize any any issue. Because see, the idea is that is that the person is trying to authenticate, right? Okay, that's something first, right? Big time. See, that's exactly what yep. is happening. Okay, yep. let me let me authenticate yep. the um, person and and the account because right. you don't want to send out $10,000. Maybe you send out a dollar. Right. Yeah. But if you, but if you lose a dollar, I yeah. mean, it's not going to hurt too much. <laughs> yeah, not a game changer. Right. Might have to skimp on your coffee and not have the extra <laughs> right. vente latte or whatever. Yeah. But, um, it reminds me of a famous quote by a famous president, uh, that said, trust, but verify. Trust, right. But verify. So you, you can't live in a cave and not do anything online and just figure, you know, you're going to put all your money on our mattress or whatever. Right. Um, so, uh, yeah. Okay. So last topic, unless obviously you want to add anything to this, but I think that topic that you've, um, defined in previous podcasts, uh, uh, would behoove us to reiterate again, this, this concept of multi-factor authentication. Yeah. What does that mean in layman's terms? Something that you know, and something you have. Okay. Okay. So, so you think about, um, now when you, probably have to log on to certain websites, right? When you put in your username and password, then it'll send a code to your email right, yeah. address or something like that, right? Which is a soft token. Okay. Right? Well, you also can have a hard token, which is a token device that will go and have have a token code on there. And, and when you put your username and password in, it will go and um, it will go and ask for that code from your particular token device, which is a hard token, right? So, so when you think about multi-factor authentication, it is about something you know and something you have. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, so you know your username and password. Right. Right. So what you have is a token. Yeah. Okay. okay? So it's two levels. Now, now I want to add on that too is that there's a third level, which is called something you are, is where you add in some biometrics. Yeah. Okay. Like so, fingerprints or whatever. Yes. Yes. You know your eyes. <laughs> scanning. Scanning your yeah, eyes. Yeah. You know your fingerprints or right. or you put the palm or your hand oh, yeah. down in this little decoder or something right. like that. Right. So, so those are some ways to protect yourself. But I will say that uh, probably about eighty five percent of the website works so much under MFA. Uh, I know for a fact there are probably a few that do not use MFA. Right. But I would tell a user to search options on that. Okay. Okay. Now the challenge with MFA is that 
that you would need to have access to your email or cell phone so you can get a code or something like that. Right. Yeah, sometimes it's been annoying. Like we use the service Fiverr and some other services. They do that that code. But I'm on my phone, um, respond to their email, but they send me a text. I have to leave my email to check the text and get the uh, code. <laughs> and then I go back to the email, enter in that code, but it's... It, um, it doesn't accept it because I kind of left my email and you go in this kind of circle, but uh, they're kind of rectifying some of that. So um, what you just mentioned about, um, you know, the token, one of the newest trends I'm kind of seeing is uh, when you're paying online, a lot of these companies, there's seems like only a, a handful of them, but it's becoming more and more prominent. Matter of fact, we're using a new widget and it was asking if we wanted to add this feature to our service. And the, the premise is, it uh, asks you, you can type in your your uh, credit card number and, and so forth, expiration date, or they ask you to scan your card, take a picture of that card. That means that, because typically a cyber security, um, a cyber criminal is what it says. They're on the cyber, they're on the internet, right? And they've accessed your information. But they typically don't won't have that physical card. You're the person, the card holder that has it in your hand, right? And and um, so it's more likely they have access to your digital assets rather than your physical asset. Obviously, your card can be stolen and lost, and then you freeze it over, right? But if your card is in your hand, and that's the newest thing. I you know I grab my cell phone, and I just uh, it's not even a QR code. It just scans the the front of the back of your card with all the digits. That tells the company that you actually have that card and it's not being, uh, hasn't been on the dark web, you know, as a digital uh, real estate. You know what? I am a component of digital advancement and living in a digital age, but I think you just have to uh, realize how far they want to go into the digital age because you do have options. Right, yeah. You know, it's out there, but try not to expose yourself as much as possible and try to, you know, and being a soft target. Right. Because the more you use these applications and other things like that, you can be exposed. But, you know, I just kind of think that if someone wants to uh, pay by their cell phones, you know, you swipe the QR code right. or whatever, you know, that's on you. Yeah. But at the same time, you know, a person needs to understand the risks that are imposed because we live in a digital world. And I think probably uh, to each his own, but I think it's a, another good rule of thumb to say um, at this benchmark, I'm not going to do a hundred percent digital transaction, right? And set whatever money increment works for you. So right. anything over 50, 100, 500, you know, I'm going to add a, another personal level of uh, security or, or um, right. authentication, right? Well, so if you're at a coffee shop, whatever, and you know, or uh, making a transaction less than fifty bucks, um, you know, the worst case scenario, you lose that, and I ever recoup it, right? Right. But so, it's different if you're dealing with a mortgage or something or a car payment or whatever, right? Yeah. You know, you know, Rich, you are 100 percent correct. But you know the that's two in a row. Well, you know the <laughs> if worst, we had more time, I could reach the three, but we're almost out of time. Yeah. You know, I'm going to make this quick. You okay. know, the worst thing about using cash yeah. versus the digital currency right. is that when you use cash, you know, you, you might not get your change back. So. <laughs> <laughs> You've been holding on that one for a while, it sounds like. It's like the Yogi Berra uh, comment. What was it? it says, uh, cash is almost as good as money. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. On that note, uh, Dwayne, any closing uh, comments or call to action for us, for uh, you and your listeners? Yeah. Yes. If you're a listener out there, please. Please sign up for my Facebook page. It's called the Chief of Cybersecurity. And if you have any questions about cybersecurity, that is a repository so that I can answer questions that you may have concerning the cybersecurity ecosystem. And you stay cyber safe. See you next time.